Good morning and welcome to this week's recruitment discussion with Jump. Uh, we've had a little bit of a technical hitch as we start today's session, but uh, there's nothing new there with uh, us having technical hitches. Uh, so we're probably not going to have a presentation, but what we'll do is have more of a chat uh, with Heather and I with regards to what's actually happening in the market and what's going on. And this week's discussion is all about recruitment in 2024. Could it be that simple? You know, as we speak, I think probably Mr Hunt is most likely sweating somewhere in the corner of Parliament, waiting to deliver these autumn statements, something that he will announce will no doubt affect the recruitment market and the strategies of every company who are recruiting in the UK. So we can't really touch on those things today. But next week, we will touch on the, those things because next week we'll have Neil Carberry on from the REC who will be breaking down the autumn statement and what he sees for recruitment in 2024. So that'll be a really interesting session. But this week, what we'll look at is we're going to look at what's changing and what we think we can do. And so I've been going through loads of research papers with what's been going on and how things are going. So things that are happening, pay transparency is going to be rapidly gaining traction in the recruitment realm. Partially thanks to the legislation, things like the Pay Transport Directive has come through from the European Parliament, and that is a directive which has been adopted since April 2023, where EU companies are required to share information on salaries and take actions if the gender pay gap is more than 5% or greater than 5%. That is coming into the UK, and that's going across the UK. Gen Zers will be entering the labour market. So depending on what country you're in, it's projected that 23% of the labour force will be Gen Zers. 25, sorry, 75% of the labour force will be millennials. So we're going to have very different labour force predictions coming up. Okay, one of the predicted recruitment trends for 2024 is the market will shift from being a very candidate-driven market to an employer-driven market. So how that's going to impact you? And once again, will recruiters and hiring managers have leverage? not to compromise on certain things when it comes to recruitment. Uh, so there's a lot to sort of look at from there. Organisations will be leveraging AI and big data to make smarter hiring decisions and metrics such as the cost of vacancy, the cost to hire will be measured more meticulously, which will help companies hire faster and find better candidates while being better at accurately forecasting the requirements and the budget to require. In the upcoming year, a significant trend is poised to reshape the recruitment industry, which is the trend of working with business leaders, where recruiters are no longer just a source of placing talent. Instead, recruiters will become a function as a strategic partner. Sorry, I think someone said we can't hear. Okay, uh, as a, a strategic partner, okay, and have a deeper understand of the broader business landscape, especially the talent landscape and what's there. So recruiters tomorrow, tomorrow are really expected to be top of their dark market dynamics, look at the competitive positioning and look at the industry specific challenges in there. And obviously the final one that's gonna change is hybrid working. Uh, the COVID pandemic sort of put flexible working right at the widespread of popularity and its surge was almost one-tenth in a proportion or one-tenth of companies adopted it, should I say, in 20 and 2021, followed by a 4% increase in subsequent years. However, in 2023, it's only grown by a modest 1%, and 31% of job adverts are now only explicitly mentioning flexible working. So is that going to disappear? Is that going to go? And obviously, the gig economy is expected to continue in its popularity, and we'll see more people out doing flexible working, project-based working. So we've got a lot to sort of cover and a lot to look at from there. So looking at this then, Heather, okay, we've got a massively evolving landscape. And we're going to try to take this more into a conversation than sort of a question and answer session. There's a massive recruitment sort of evolving landscape. And there are specific trends that we're going to foresee that's going to significantly impact the business in 2024. So if we start to think about clients and candidates and agencies, if you were looking at that, what sort of trends would you look at or what trends do you see coming forward 
in 2024. And I've got a real good view of what I think is coming forward, but I'd be interested to see what you think is coming forward. Um, I'll tell you what I'm hoping for, Howard. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not quite sure that I've I've got a crystal ball on this, but my my gut is that 2024 is going to be a better year for recruitment than 2023 has been. And that what, what we might get is a little bit more stability. So 2023 has been so difficult to predict. It's been it's been quite unstable. Obviously, this is very much dependent on the market that you're operating in. And some have had blinders and some have had more more difficult challenges. But for me, I think 2024 is going to be a little bit calmer. I don't think the economy will be interested to hear what Neil's got to say uh, when we talk to Neil next week. Um, but unless the uh, Chancellor does something dramatic in uh, his autumn statement, you know, I don't think the economy is going off a cliff and things are going to gently go back to a little bit of normality next year. The, the other big trends are gonna that are going to hit are we're going to really start to understand how much AI is going to impact us as an industry. So we I don't think we've really even touched on what a difference that AI can make. And I think next year is going to really we're going to bed down and see whether or not it is going to make a difference, whether or, whether we are smart enough as an industry to take advantage of the real benefits that AI can bring us. Um, and the, the more sophisticated automation um, can can bring us. Well, I'm going to specifically talk about AI a little bit later on. Uh, okay. So you can sort of see what we, we, we talk about AI. But I think, you know, what I'm thinking and I'm talking to recruitment agencies, I'm also speaking to a lot of business leaders. And the thing that I sort of see is that the service offering that we push out towards candidates and clients is going to become absolutely more customer focused as we move away from transactional recruitment and i yeah, think a hundred percent and i think what's happening is if you think about the millennials and the gen Zers coming into the marketplace they don't accept poor services and they're happy to walk away from anybody that gives them a poor service and not go back to them so i think we're going to see more clients move towards true partnerships with agencies but only if they see the benefit of working with that agency as a professional recruiter. So I think the trends that have been growing for the last 18 to 24 months are where clients have sort of signed deals with recruitment agencies based on service, not based on price. And I think more and more clients are starting to see the benefit of working with recruiters in that way. So they'll see the benefits of partnering. But it's the benefit with partnering with clients as recruitment agencies that have got that candidate acquisition specialist really locked down. And so if you've not already started to move that dial away from transactional recruitment, what do you get? What today? Let me go and find it for you to what are you getting over the next six months, 12 months? Let me now go acquire those people for you before that. I think agencies will benefit from moving from what I would class as that red ocean strategy where you're competing against lots yeah. of recruitment agencies to more of a blue ocean strategy where you're the only service offering to the client. But that means recruiters have to look at their services and how they can be packaged in a way that clients see them as a true benefit. And the trend is not about cutting costs. It's about increasing service levels, developing better services and increasing price. And I think that's the trend that we're going to see that we'll be able to add more price and more costs to our services, but only if the client sees the value. Yeah, and, and the thing that aligns to that, Howard, I think is cultural alignment and ethics. I've seen a lot of posts on LinkedIn recently about this where organisations are failing. Clients want to work with recruitment partners who mirror their values and their ethics. So I think as an industry, in moving away from transactional to true partnership, you can make sure that the behaviours that you are instilling um, in your recruiters in and in and we we'll, we'll come on to this in the next question and thinking about candidate journey is that we are portraying the values and the ethics of our clients because I've seen some truly awful behaviors from our industry that don't reflect the client and equally I've seen it the other way around where they uh, where the recruiters making the client look better than they actually are <laughs> so... it, it's really interesting that you, you, we have that conversation because the amount of clients that you know when we start to work with lots of new clients and they start to build their you know, 
business plan for the next three years, one of the first things we talk about is what their values are. Yeah. And it's really amazing how many recruitment agencies, owners, are almost stumped with that question. What are your values? What's your mission statement? What's that look like? And they're stumped. And it's almost because they've had a really good, strong uh, marketing company create something for them, but that's not their true values. And it's really interesting when they start to deliver their true values, what actually happens. And it was an interesting conversation that I had with one of my clients yesterday uh, about talking to your clients and going out and having a proper conversation with them rather than just a conversation about yeah know, about really transactional good. recruitment right because we all know how to do that but how do we have proper proper consulting conversations and values is a really great way to have a more sophisticated deeper stronger conversation with your clients that has impact for them as well as you and so she had this conversation yesterday with a client who's given her four jobs all high-end jobs that he said would normally have gone to other recruitment agencies because he didn't think that she did that. But because they were talking about what's happening in their employment marketplace and what's happening down the line, he's going to four jobs, all at 75 grand plus, all to start in March next year. All because she was talking about the run-up and the, uh, having a longer lens to create better people or find yeah. better people. He'd never even thought about that conversation. And he said he's glad he had, gave her the jobs. Now she's got three months, four months, really, to go out and find some really good candidates. And my prediction is that she'll probably place those jobs in end of January, beginning of February, and they'll take those people before March. And they're thinking, go out to the market in March. We'll get people started in April, May. They'll get those people started who are mobilising their recruitment workforce a lot quicker by having a higher lens on business. So it starts to show that if you have those deeper conversations, not just about today, then it does work. But if we then flip that conversation, because that's very much about the specific trends for the recruitment market, with candidates' expectations then, they're expecting a more personal, streamlined experience. And how do you think recruitment agencies can enhance the candidate journey? And I think when we've talked about this, at the start of lockdown, Lots of surveys was going around about what clients were doing the previous year. They said, this is what we think about coming into you know, 19, uh, 2020, 2021. And obviously, they weren't expecting the lockdown to happen. And one of the top three quotes, quotes were that they wanted to improve the candidate journey and they wanted to improve their ability to attract better candidates into the marketplace. And I think COVID changed all that. It became more of a candidate-driven marketplace. Clients got a little bit skittish let's say about finding people and it starts to really produce a problem but the stats and forecasts are starting to say now that we're moving back towards a client market however i still think there's a candidate shortage and i think it's the shortage of quality candidates will not increase it will only get smaller so i think we need to stop thinking about candidates as i've always classed them as we think as candidates as a throwaway product we engage with them when we engage in a job and then disengage with them as soon as they fall out of the recruitment process, wherever that process is. And it's almost that sort of, um, it's that whirlwind holiday romance type scenario, isn't it? You yeah. meet someone, you fall in love, and then you go home and you feel completely forget about them. That is what <laughs> love bombing, is. love yeah. bombing, however. Is, <laughs> I've never been called a love bomber in my life, but there you go. <laughs> uh, but, that's what I see is happening, where I think, however, if we take the candidate journey from when they first engage with a recruitment agency and then have a thought process, if we continue to engage with them through their working life, would we get a better return from our candidate acquisition? Would candidates feel more that we are a career advisor? We're advising about their work and home life balance. And therefore, we're creating an agency which could generally have loyal candidates, those unique candidates that when I started in the, you know, the, the early 90s, we had unique candidates that no one else had because we were speaking to them constantly. So I think that journey pre-requirement engagement needs to work. That journey post-engagement needs a massive improvement. However, lots could be automated and personalised. But I think as a candidate, I want to engage where I feel wanted as a workforce moves towards or moves from 
baby boomers to millennials to Gen Zers, that service we give them is going to be critical because they've got so much more choice and they are very quick to exercise that choice if they get bad service. And, and you know, this is so close to my heart at the moment, Howard, because I'm supporting my Gen Z son with job search at the moment. And, you know, it's been a real eye opener for me because, you know, I, I get the whole time shortage thing. And that's why we only engage with the candidates um, where we're in a recruitment process with them and where they're, you know, I, I really obviously been having been immersed in this for all of my career. I get it. But. Um, with his job search, he has applied for a, a huge number of jobs through clients and through agencies. And without fail, the jobs where he's applied directly to the clients, he's had a response, automated, but a response with an expectation of how long it's going to take and what the process is going to be. And do you know what's happened with the agencies that it's applied for? And we're talking about large numbers of agencies. He hasn't had a single response. From an agency not even an automated response from any job that he's applied to with an agency now i i get it he's at the beginning of his career but in one or two years time he's going to be exactly the sort of candidate these tech recruiters are going to be desperate to to take and put into jobs right because he is in a market that's candidate short but not a single one of those agencies has the foresight to go, do you know what I mean? Do you know, if I engage with this person and say, actually, we probably can't place you, but thanks for sending us your CV, keep us updated on your career, you know, an automated email response, not a single agency um, has bothered to to have an automated response. I have to say, none of them ever are on Jump. <laughs> they're, not, <laughs> they're not agencies that work with Jump. They're not agencies, any of, any of the people listening. But honestly, I was so so appalled for him for my industry when I'm going you know apply through agencies they're fantastic they're going to be able to help to advocate for you and stuff nothing nothing at all and I find that tragic Howard do you know we've been talking about this since the 1990s or I've been talking about it since the 1990s and about that yeah. engagement and yeah we'll, we'll talk about automation a, a little bit later on but if you think about then the pitfalls that or the mistakes that agencies make when it comes to candidate experience, that's the first massive pitfall that we yeah. have. And so when we start to think about recommending or you know, strategies to avoid these pitfalls, it's not rocket science. No, no. It, and you know, a couple of people have, have gone on have, have put on our a chat today, you know, that they respond within 48 hours or you know, they always respond to everybody. And and I that I had assumed both of you Helen and Deborah that that was everybody's that was what every agency would do but it, honestly it's not <laughs> it, it really isn't but I think it's the it's the it's the way that we can get to candidates and speak with candidates quicker and easier I'll take a, a, a I was speaking to a lady yesterday who's uh, she's not working with me she, she ran me for some advice so she's been running a recruitment agency for about just over a year now and has had an awful problem since February, she's not made a placement. However, when she started the agency, quickly she got 20 temps up and running, but found that her time was so absorbed with sending paper timesheets, trying to contact these people, scheduling where they were working, scheduling what they were doing, etc., that she didn't have time to do any work. And so she thought that the temp market wasn't a market that she wanted to be in, and moved away from the temp market, let her temps dissolve, and since February hasn't made a placement in Perm or trying to move into the contract market. There actually isn't a contract market in her in her area. But didn't realise that you could automate all of those things to make the candidate experience so much more pleasurable, but it's your experience as a recruiter as well. And what Deborah is talking about and what Helen's talking about is that experience of speaking to a candidate when they are first, let's call it, virginal in their recruitment you know, exploits and they're moving into that marketplace. If you capture them then and give them an experience at that point, then they will always come back to you and they will always talk to you because, as you said, the majority of the market just simply do not engage with their candidate marketplace. 
So I think that first part of the candidate experience is all about talking to the candidate. Yes, you might get swapped with a lot of candidates that aren't quite right for the job. So yes, an automated response would suffice. But those that are probably 80% right for the job to 99% right for the job should all have a conversation because they're, yeah, all, absolutely. they're all in the exit lounge and they're all candidates that you could potentially place into other clients. Well, and yeah. Howard, the jobs that he's got interviews for, he was only 60% qualified for, right? But the, the client couldn't find somebody who was suitable for the job. Mm -hmm. And so they've gone back to the rest and they're now interviewing the people that they can train into the job. The agencies have all missed that and he won't work he would never apply to an agency again unless i obviously i'm going to fight the corner for those because for those <laughs> for those on the i know that there are great agencies out there like the ones that are commenting uh on here helen and deborah and claire i, I know that 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 there are great agencies that he's just been really 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 unlucky but it you know it's it's just really brought home to me how important that is you know what, Deborah's come up to and put a conversation on there, a comment on there, until you speak to someone, how do you know? Yeah. And that was drilled into me into the 90s, that you could yeah. look at a CV, if it looks like they've even touched what you're looking at, call them, because you never know. Yeah. They might be the worst person in the world at writing CVs. Yeah. And that is so true, that speaking to the people, you find all sorts of different things oh i didn't put that on my cv because to me that's just an expectation i didn't realize it was a requirement that the yeah. clients want i just thought they'd know because i've put this on that they do that so i think there's a lot of things that we can start to talk about to clients and candidates mm -hmm. and saying let's get this information out and we've got to start thinking and, about and the that. onus is on us i think as recruiters to train our recruiters well because you know the other thing about gen z is they don't like picking up the phone <laughs> Right. They, they don't like speaking on the telephone. So we, we have to really work hard to train that in. Yeah. And we're going to get lots of changes that every single day. I mean, yeah, my son, if, if it's not a grunt, <laughs> then, it's a then, it's a then, then it's a text. <laughs> so I get lots of grunts and the odd text every day. And the text is usually in a grunting style because it's about three words you know <laughs> <laughs> you ask him if you ask him what you want for tea you might get a text back food well thanks for that yeah but yeah so it's how they communicate and we've got to think that these people are coming more and more into the marketplace so therefore how we train people how we develop people and i think this is part of one of the common mistakes that we make is that we don't follow the trends early enough mm -hmm. and basically put our heads in the sand and hope to survive and I think we've got to think about if we start to think about first mover advantage in a changing marketplace, those who adapt the quickest will get the best results. And if you just think about the advent of video, you know, I was talking about that two or three years before COVID came and almost got laughed out of a room in Glasgow because they said, oh, who's going to unearth new video? Sat in the room was Odro <laughs> at the time, you know, and, and he was just giggling to himself. But the comment was that it suddenly, when it came out, everyone exploded. Now, not everyone needs to use video, but video, AI, and other processes, because we don't pick up on those trends quick enough, means that we've got a massive problem. So if we think that, we often talk in training staff about using the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, okay? What business practices would you then say, as a HR professional, would you say could be simplified? So sourcing strategies, require, recruitment strategies, qualification, efficiencies, et cetera, would improve in 2024? Um, so I've got a couple of quick, quick hits for you that, again, they come from the experience I've had recently job searching. So, so list your jobs on on uh, on job boards and on LinkedIn properly. So the number of jobs that I've seen listed as entry level, because that's what I'm looking for at the moment. And then when you click through, they say three years experience, 10 years experience was one of them. I have an automated message now on LinkedIn where I provide feedback on vacancies. It says, this is not an entry level job. <laughs> this is not an entry level job. So if you're not building your screening criteria properly in your efforts and honestly it's so common that if you think people are doing this well in your business they're probably not go back and revisit it that that they're listing them properly um 
the, the other one, the really simple one is put the salary on the job. I know, I know that one's subject to debate and have people have really different opinions on it, but I put the salary on the job, e even if it's a range that's so helpful when you're searching and you just don't bother if there's no uh, salary on the job. So so that's that's a really, really big one. Use automation as much as you can. There is some amazing automation out there, but be smart about it. Think about what it what you're automating and how you're automating, uh, and think about the DE and I, uh, the DE and I piece to make sure that you're if you're going to use automated screening, that you're thinking about what it's screening in and out, um, and that you're using it in a really smart uh, uh, and clever clever way. But those are um, those are real big ones for me at the moment because they're really current for what I'm dealing with. They drive me nuts. So I think to me it boils down into that sort of capability versus capacity. Yeah. And I think whenever you look through all of your recruitment processes, how good are we actually at delivering that process? So what's mm. the execution like of that process? Is it good? So basically, is your capability of delivering the process that we've got absolutely fine-tuned? You then start to think about the capacity that you can create. So what you're talking about there, AI could create more time, which gives you more capacity to speak to more people. So we start to think about it in that way. But it also means that you can start to see where your consultants or where your business is getting to saturation point. Actually, yes. we need more people in the business or we need to more clients or more candidates in the business because we've got the capability, but we haven't got the capacity to fill the jobs. Yeah. And this flips to, again, to a question I was uh, talking to a couple of weeks ago with a, with a client about building certain products with it, with, within their base. And it was going out and understanding what the client's capacity is and therefore what's the market capability of filling that capacity. And that was a very different question about what, you know, how you're going to put recruit into there because they could have done it in so many different ways. And once they started to have that conversation with the client that they were pitching at, they had a very different lead into what the client was actually doing and the yeah. knowledge of the client. So I think best practice in the business is keep it simple, stupid. We've got to be able to listen to our clients and our candidates more rather than just asking the question, are you looking for a job? Have you got a job? Because that, I think, is the simple part but if you start to put better questions into your clients and listen to what they're saying to you, then you'll get a better understanding of what their capacity is likely to be and therefore what's your capability of filling that position with your market knowledge and what happens in that market knowledge. And I think that's where we really as consultants, Howard, can bridge some of these gaps. So, you know, there is a tendency for individuals to build their processes and systems based on their own point of view. So clients build theirs based on their point of view. Consultants build theirs based on their point of view. And candidates want something completely different. But, you know, we can really be a bridge to help clients understand that their process needs to meet the needs of their candidates. Um, and we can help clients to build better processes. And we can build our processes more effectively by listening to our clients and listening to our candidates and I, I think there's a real communication bridge that we can be quite sophisticated about so it goes into something that we'll, we'll talk we'll, we'll, we'll move that into that, that conversation now and it goes into yeah. that conversation of trust so if you think you know giving sort of growing importance that you keep talking about ai and the importance of ai coming into the, the recruitment processes and we keep talking about how agencies strike the right balance between automation and maintaining human touch in their interactions with candidates and clients and I think this is where that sort of starts to move. That if we think about, I don't think any recruiter should lose their job or their job will be replaced because of automation. No. I think no, that's I don't thing. think so at all. And people keep talking about that on LinkedIn and in the press. And I, I just cringe at the thought of you know, no. that. I think what it should do is give recruiters more time to engage properly with their marketplace, which means the most important tool in the recruitment armory will not be AI. It means that the most important tool is back to the phone, picking the phone up and talking to people. So one of the stats that came out, I was reading, as always, reading loads of stats, it was a really interesting comment that every 
100 emails a recruiter sends to clients. So every 100 emails a client sends, only 25% of those recruiters follow up that email with a call. Only 5% follow up that email with a second call. Yet 100% of those first emails get a second email, a third email, a fourth email, and so on. So what it says is that clients are getting absolutely swamped with the email marketing, okay, but no one's speaking to the client. Now, we then just roll that into the client, in the, into the candidate. So you start to think about making that candidate for life. You don't have to be calling them every 30 seconds, but no. you could be texting, you could be emailing, you could be putting stuff onto LinkedIn that helps to keep you in the forefront. And that's all about AI. So it's how you will engage with your market properly. And I think AI will give the good recruiter that opportunity to engage more. And wherever I've been in my 30 odd years of recruitment, I can always tell you by either walking into an office or just looking at telephone stats, who is the most prolific recruiter in that office? Because it's the one that's on the phone. It's yeah. simply it's the one that's engaging with their market. It's not the email warrior. It's not the people that is, you know, you know, people laugh and say, oh, two hours on the phone, it's a really hard task to make. And yet you look at all the big recruiters, they're not making two hours on the phone. They're doing three, four, five hours on the phone because they're talking to their market all the time. So I think how we engage really is important. And I think AI gives recruiters more time to cultivate true relationships. Well, I think it helps us to to um, craft the role properly. So especially as we move forward with hiring younger people who are less comfortable with a telephone conversation, if we don't use AI effectively and automation effectively, then the likelihood is they will fall into those things that they're most comfortable with that will give them a reason not to be on the phone. So it makes it even more important that we hire the right people and that we train them well so that we give them the confidence and the skills to be able to pick up the phone and to understand why that is a differentiator. Because I, I completely agree with you, Howard. You know, the people who will get on the telephone, yeah, they are going to be the most successful. So do how do we give the new set of people coming into recruitment the skills and the confidence to do that, the safe environment to feel that they can do that? Because there are a lot of young people who are not comfortable with that and so we have to use the ai in a clever way and we have to create the right roles so i think we've got to start to think about then if you start to look at the right balance between automation and that human touch then i always sort of look at the grunt work that recruiters yeah. have to do ai can absolutely do that grunt work that then frees up loads of time yeah and let's go back to eight hours in a in a, in a day for the average recruiter for most recruiters it's 10 12 13 14 <laughs> okay but we look at we look at that sort of average eight hours a day if we're only doing two hours on the phone then what are yeah. we doing in those what are we doing hours? the rest of the time yeah and those are the six hours yeah. so if we can create automation that creates a huge gap okay in that six hours mm. fill that gap with speaking to your candidates and clients and i think that becomes a very thing and we talk about the trends in 2024 Okay, and we start to think about that biggest trend is the engagement with your client base and the services that you're going to give to your client base, but also the services you're going to give to your candidates. The biggest service that you can give is actually communicating with them and yeah. talking with them and keeping them in part of the loop. Something occurs to me that I'll be interested in the people who are listening to us. Um, if any of those people listening to us are have candidates who are younger do those younger candidates not want to be spoken to on the phone and actually actively want to be communicated with via whatsapp and email and and is there a trend that means that the historic view that those people who are on the phone are the most successful is that going to change or is that going to stay the same so i'd love to know if there's anybody listening who has a very young uh, candidate market if that if that's the case or it might be that it's too early for us to know that but just to turn our thinking on its head there for a minute so I'll give my son's viewpoint yeah. who's 21 22 looking for a job when he was looking for a job 
he found it very frustrating that people weren't coming back to him and he was getting texts and emails. He's dyspraxic, so following all these different things that were coming in from different areas was really difficult for him. And he said the people that he gelled with most are the people who just picked up the phone and spoke to him because he knew exactly yeah. what they were talking about. So he's not a great communicator when you first talk to him, but once you talk to him and he then opens up, then he's happy to communicate at all levels and, and, and what have you. So it's that viewpoint of having that bridge. And sometimes I think young people are great at communicating. What they're not great at is that introduction into people that they've never spoken to before. Because as kids, we were thrown out and you had to talk to other people, etc. You couldn't sit on your phone and do stuff on your phone. You had to speak to other people. They've never had to do that. So having talked to strangers is quite a strange thing for them. Well, particularly the, the particularly the young people who are coming out now who have had kind of not had the same experiences because of the weirdness of the last few years. Um, I think that's probably massively true of young people at the moment. Helen, it's great to hear that um, that, you know, even where people want to deal with WhatsApp or, or text, you encourage them to talk. Right. Because then they have it's a life skill isn't it they need to learn how to communicate on on the telephone so um that's great to hear helen thank you so as helen's brooke talking about whatsapp i was thinking what's western australia or text what's western no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's that sort of thing so if you think it, you know we're talking about tools so you come across lots of people that sort of bring lots of things to the marketplace so what innovative tools or techniques do you believe will be game changers in 2024 and how can agencies leverage their sort of competitive edge to deliver outstanding results? Yeah, uh, um, well, it is AI, isn't it? It, it? it is AI, it's automation. Um, it, we all already have in our tech stack automation tools that we're not using, all of us because we've pretty much all got Microsoft Office and there is a load of automation that you can do in Microsoft Office that we're not using and that we don't do. So, uh, you know, I, I just think it's it's all about understanding what are the grunt jobs that we do not need to be doing manually. We do not need to have people spending time on, as you've just described, um, Howard. And I, I think we've probably got most of the tools we need already. I think you might have a different perspective on that, but... Um, but it, it's about understanding what the job is and how do we get people on the phone um, and how do we take things away? How do we understand what are the parts of the process that we need to keep and what are the parts of the process that we don't? So I think when I start to look at innovation tools and people often ask, what should I buy? What should I bring in? And they, they come to us and ask lots of questions about technology. I go back and say, okay, let's have a look at your processes first and look at your processes where you find that you've got repetitive processes that can be done by automation, they're the first things I'd look at. So if I start to think about emailing candidates to keep candidates in the loop of what's going on, that could be an automated process that's very easy to do, etc. If I want to get people on the phone more, I could be really horrible and say an automation process is I'm going to stick a telephone system in there that says it's just going to ring and ring and keep ringing. Every time you put the phone down, it will pick up the phone and ring again. But that's not really what I would be sort of thinking about from there. So I'm thinking about things that would help people become better at their jobs. So I think anything that's to do with automation with regarding sending emails out, anything that comes to the candidate journey and helping the candidate journey, I'd be developing that. And anything that helps us find more candidates quickly and more efficiently is something we have um, a lady on a couple of weeks ago talking about using Boolean logic. And people yes. Said, oh, people said, oh my God, I've not come, come across Boolean logic, although we're doing bits of it for so long. But it's all of those things yeah. that you, know, you can start to implement into your business. But then there's a cost versus you know, productivity comment. What are you doing? So if I'm going to put a cost into my business, what's the return of, on investment from a productivity point of view? that will make me more money. So sometimes I'm thinking that cost is too expensive for what it's going to bring back to me. That cost is perfect. That's what we'll develop. So I look at it from where the blockers are, where the repetitive business is, look at what the cost is going to be to change that and what impact would it have on my time, on my recruiter's time to do that. And we, 
we, we talked about a, a client up in Scotland that implemented a new CRM into mm. their business, implemented automation with regards to time sheeting flow, et cetera, et cetera. And she came back and said that put eight hours a week back into their 10th market consultants per head. And her the, business a lot of difference, months, isn't it? How... Her business in the next four months almost doubled on that temp market because they yeah. had eight hours each a week to spend more time with candidates and clients, etc. So yeah. I think it's really important that we start to think about automation that enables us to do our jobs quicker and more efficient, but without adding cost, but adding bottom line profit yeah. based on the cost that you're giving. Yeah. And one of the things that I saw in a previous incarnation was that even where the intent was there to br to make those changes, if you don't bring your consultants with you, you, you don't get the change. So remember, when you're doing all of these things, when you're thinking about automation and technology and, and, and reworking the job and getting people on the phone, these are change projects. People are resistant to change. So think really carefully about the project plan and the implementation and the training and, you know, involve the people in your business with the planning to make those changes. You know, the eight hours of free time, you know, drove their business forward because they made a decision to spend that extra eight hours on business development, getting on the phone, dealing with more clients, dealing with more candidates. If you make the changes to free people up, but you don't help them to understand what the additional time is for, you get people drifting back into doing things the way they've always done it. So this stuff, it's not just about like identify the way the process should be different. You've got to have a change program to take people on that journey with you to make it work. And I've seen change programs fail really badly where you don't do that. So the last topic that we I really want to sort of touch on is if we look at the increasingly competitive talent marketplace, what strategies and tactics do you recommend for recruitment agencies to stand out and attract top tier candidates or candidates and how can recruitment agencies assist clients in their endeavor to also attract top tier candidates it it for, for me it is all about where we started this which brings us full cycle in in this particular uh, webinar howard it's about understanding the values and ethics and strategic desires of your clients and your own and aligning them so you know i still think that de and i is a massive massive opportunity for recruitment businesses to stand out and for some reason as an industry we seem some to be a little bit reluctant on that but for many many clients getting their de and i strategy right and attracting wider client um uh, populations candidate populations it's really it's a biggie so i think in terms of a strategy in an increasingly making yourself stand out by being ethical by having values by not being the cliched recruiter that clients think they are to move into consulting and partnership with clients based on values is hugely important next year and that's where we started this webinar However, I think D and I is a bit that we is the bit that I think we could still do more on. So I'm going to push it very much down the candidate marketplace, and okay. down the client marketplace. I think if you want to increase your talent pool and increase your capabilities of attracting top tier candidates or any candidates and also assist your clients in doing that, then to me, it's very simple. Where do your candidates hang out? Mm. Now, I look at my age group and we are very much still hanging out on Facebook. I look at my kids, they go, we don't go on Facebook, Dad. We don't look at Facebook. We're all... I'm older than you and I don't go on Facebook, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was made to go on Facebook for various <laughs> different reasons. But if you look at your kids, the Gen Zers, they're all on TikTok. They're all on Hello. They're all on platforms that I've never heard of and no, haven't a clue how to optimise that platform. But this is where candidates are hanging out. If you think that 25% of the marketplace will be Gen Zers by the end of next year, so do you not think we should be hanging out where they hang out? Should we not be discovering the channels where they are hanging out in 
because that's critical for attraction. So if you're seen in the same place where they're all hanging out, we will be able to attract that. And I think as an industry, we've been really slow at picking up on that, even if when you start to think about things such as Facebook. Facebook is the biggest marketplace where people find their jobs. And yet we still get to spend massive amounts of money on the job boards and never put anything into attraction into Facebook. So I think we've got to start to think is how we attract candidates, where do our candidates hang out, what can we do to put our places in there. Now, Sarah's put, uh, Sarah's put something in there. One of our consultants connected through online gaming. But that would be amazing. Another, yeah. But if you're advertising on an online gaming platform, how many people are on those platforms? So if your market is, you know, a marketplace that might be, you know, Activity. There are some enormous communities of people on gaming platforms. Absolutely enormous communities. I love that, Sarah. But there are other platforms available that people are on constantly that we should be engaging with. And we all get fed up with pop-up adverts, etc. But I tell you what, when a pop-up advert comes up that you want to explore, you explore it. Yeah. So, so it's exactly <laughs> the same. If your candidates are seeing your pop-up constantly, it's like you're just tapping at their viewpoint all the time. It's why people like Coca-Cola and Wrigley Spearmint Gum constantly advertise. They don't have to because they're the biggest brands in the world, but they have to to stay the biggest brand in the world because they're constantly reminding people, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. Yeah. And then you walk into a shop and that's when the, you buy the product. It's exactly the same with recruitment. We're here, we're here, we're here when they want to change jobs. And bearing in mind that the Gen Zers and the Millennials will be changing job more often than any other generation in the past, should we not be therefore making ourselves more known to them by being in the same channels that they are in? And that's it. It's a very interesting thing when you think 2024, could it be that simple? I think you're right in what you said at the beginning, the market is going to come back. I'm so waiting to see what Mr. Hunt says today because that will help <laughs> accelerate, hopefully accelerate the market and not crash it like 12 months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can, can we have a better awesome statement? Thank you. Um, but I think that the market, all the trends in the market are saying that it's starting to stabilise and it's starting to see the, the, the upward turn again. And I think we've got to embrace that and sort of look at that in, in, in what it actually is. But then if you want to really take advantage of it, then I think you you need to be the first movers in certain marketplaces, certain trends, certain mm. technology, et cetera, to give yourself that competitive advantage. And I think it will all boil down to, in the next three to five years, the quality of your service, not the cost of your service. Ladies and gents, thank you for your time. It's been great. Heather, thank you for your input. It's always great to listen to it from a HR point of view. Next week, ladies and gents, as you've heard at the beginning, we have Neil Carberry on who will be giving his thoughts on the autumn statement and recruitment as a whole, 2023, 2024 and beyond. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. Heather, thank you very much. Enjoy your rest of your day, people. Thank uh, look you, Howard. See you again. See you. Goodbye. Bye.